I think the last thing we were discussing was the combinatorics of the boundary, which is what uh, contributes the boundary strata classes, which are among the natural classes we were considering. So if you remember, we consider three types of natural classes, which is one to call tautological classes. And we actually were discussing how to define them in BARGN. So we had the side classes that were coming from the marked points. So if there are no marked points, they don't exist, but then by taking a push forward by a psi class on the universal curve, one gets the kappa classes. So these are all in co-dimension one. This, these can be, have arbitrary co-dimension. And the lambda classes that were the chain classes of the Hodge bundle. And then we said, well, but these, there are things coming from the interior of M bar GN, so it's something which makes sense on MGN itself. So if we want to have something which is coming from the boundary, well, at least for sure we want to have the boundary strata classes. So the fundamental classes of the, of the loci of, curl, of stable curves with a fixed topological type. You prefer the components of the space, of the closed uh, subspace of M bar GN, in which we prescribe to have at least a certain number of nodes. And the last thing we were, uh, we were discussing was that if we want to identify a boundary strata class, well, we can do it in a unique way by giving the associated dual graph. And gamma is, not, is a graph with a lot of extra structure because if you remember, we had to, to, to put labeling on the vertices to keep track of the genera of the components. And then, of course, we also had a, a additional structure coming from the mark points, if there are any. Moreover, there are some restrictions on the types of the graph. Of course, it has to be connected because of the fact that the curve is connected, but there are more restrictions coming from the stability condition. So if we gave an arbitrary graph, it may correspond to a class of, of curves which are unstable because they have too many automorphisms. So what we get is what we call the stable graph. Formally, We need a set V of vertices. A set H of half edges, because for each edge we need to remember where it starts and where it ends. And then we need a set of leaves or of legs of the graph. they will give the mark points. And then, of course, as I said, we need to label each graph by its genus, which anyway will be a natural number. And 
we should give the genus to the normalization of the corresponding component, so geometric genus. And then there is some kind of attribution map that says, well, for each half edge and for each leaf, to which component it is attached. So, if we have a node, It's connecting two components, so it will be a self-intersection of one component. So it will give an edge joining the two corresponding components, and an edge is just to identify the half edges. So for each half edge, we need to know where it starts, and then we will need the information which half edges we have to join. So each half edge should start somewhere, and of course also each mark point should lie somewhere. So we need attribution map from the set of half edges and leaves to the set of vertices. And then we need to know which half edges we want to join. So this is equivalent to given a point three involution on the set of half edges. So we know which edges we have, uh, which half edges we have to identify. I guess, well, we also need, uh, so the set L should be canonically identified with uh, uh, the set from 1 to N. Set, so the set of edges is just the set of orbits of this involution. Once we do this, the graph should be connected. Now it's easy to state what the stability condition should be because once we are in this situation, what do we need to do? Well, we need to count for each component the number of special points which are on it. So we need for each vertex to count the number of half edges attributed to it together with the number of leaves attributed to that. So. For each vertex, small v in v, the number of spatial points on the corresponding component is something we can denote by NV, so this is the number of things which may be either half edges of leaves the start of the given point. And this is exactly the thing that play the role in the in the stability condition. So In 
just to rephrase the condition on the genus and the number of mark points for each component. And then, of course, so the So it's clear how many mark points there are because that's just the number of legs. Yes? What happens if the graph is just one point so the curve is irreducible? How do you have, a, you can't have a fixed point free evolution? Is that not allowed? I will, should be the empty set, H. If we have no, oh. so if there are no singular points, then H should be empty. This is allowed. And then, of course. So yes, absolutely. So. Uh, this corresponds to the mark points, so the number of elements of the number of legs should be n, so this may be this is empty when there are no mark points. And this guy, of course, to have a fixed point free evolution, we always have an even number of them, but then it may well be empty because it's related to the number of singular points of the curve. Yes, and then I was saying it's very easy to, to tell from a graph what the number, what the number of mind points is, but you may wonder how we can reconstruct the arithmetic genus of the stable curve corresponding from that to that. So the idea is that the genus of gamma is just defined as taking the sum of the genera assigned to the vertices. So if, it, if there's a, but then of course also the existence of singular points make the uh, genus higher, but actually it's enough to add to this the genus of the graph corresponding to our, so just of the topological realization of the graph. So in this way, we can identify all graphs that are the correct genus. And then such a graph will have an automorphism group, which is just uh, the elements of automorphism are the bijections of the uh, sets uh, uh, V, H, and L defining the graph that respect of the rest of the structure. Of sets that respect the additional structure. So once we have such a stable graph. G with n labeled leaves. Then we can associate to it the locus of all curves in MGN bar with this dual graph. Here the dual graph has to be gamma, so for instance the number of singular points is not allowed to increase. For this reason, this is of course not closed, it's a locally closed subset of MGN bar. So it's open in its Zariski closure.
So this is the, the closed stratum associated to this. And this is, of course, a closed subset of M patchy. So the question is, how can we construct these spaces? So the strata, once we know what gamma is, let's do it first in some examples. No, it's not obvious. I mean, uh, one uh, one needs to check that this is a that this is an open condition in the closure. So, what needs to do? One needs to, if one knows that these are the connected, uh, the irreducible components of the locus, of course, with a with a fixed number, with a prescribed number of nodes, then of course uh, one knows that this is closed. Well, this is also easy to check, but then one needs to, to check explicitly that this is open. But somehow, uh, one can, once one has a good geometric description here, one can sort of use the fact that MG is open in MG bar and so on. So somehow, the only thing happening here is that uh, for each component, a dual graph, we can only attach a smooth curve. So of course there is just one stratum of dimension zero. This has just one vertex and n leaves, and this is there, and this encodes. Uh, so this is the general stratum, so if we take this to be our gamma, then we have that M gamma is just MGN, the open guy, because these are the curves that are exactly this topological type, and then of course the closure is going to be MGN itself. But what does it mean that we are in co-dimension one? As I said, it's something about the deformation theory of curves that if we are in co-dimension one, then we have one edge. So, or if you prefer, if we have one node. And there are two types of nodes, the separating nodes and the non-separating nodes. So the idea is that a, a node can be a self-intersection of a component, and this means that when we resolve that node, we get any reducible curve as normalization, that's the the uh, non-separated node, and the, in the other case we get two connected components, so that's a separated node. So what does a separating and non-separating node mean? I mean, this kind of characterization only works well when we have just one point. So it would not work. If we have more nodes, actually, it's, it's, it can be more tricky to find out whether it's truly separating or not separating. But we may discuss this later if you are, if you are curious. But the idea is that a separating node, well, so if you blow it up, we get something which is connected and of genus G minus one. So we just take, so this means that we have exactly one vertex because after the normalization we have just a component and the genus has to be G minus one because the fact that we solve the node. Then on the resolution there are the two three images of the branches of the node and they correspond to two half edges 
which uh, will have to be identified. And so this is the graph we consider in this case. And then I didn't say anything about the math points, but they are not allowed to do anything in this case because there is just one component in which they may lie. Otherwise, if we have a separating node, this means that The graph should have two vertices corresponding to the, from, to the two components. Well, I, a priori, is just any number between 0 and g. And then it depends a little bit how many we need to consider, because if we have no math points, of course, there is a symmetry between i and g minus i, so we can may stop halfway. But if we have a decoration, we also need to keep track of which points were assigned to one side and which points to the other one. So we need to take a partition of the mark points between the two nodes. And this may kill all symmetry in some cases. So somehow it's clear that it's just one boundary component in this case, but the counting the number of components here is more delicate because it depends on the number of mark points and the, and the genus involved. And then, of course, some possibilities are ruled out because of the stability conditions. So, for instance, if i is equal to 0 or 2g, we need to check that there are at least two additional map points. Yes? In this case, what are the half edges? Or are there no half edges? Yes. So, the idea is that the half edges is, are telling us uh, what we get on the normalization. So, in this case, we have one edge. So, the one half edge is starting here. The other half edge is starting. So if we call this graph gamma zero, so the question is how do we construct the elements in gamma zero? As I said, geometrically, the idea is that we have a curve. It has a node. If we normalize it, then we get a non-singular curve of genus G minus one. At least if we start with a element in this open part, m gamma 0. And we have two points, the ones, let's say, one label by one half edge and the other label by the other half edge that get identified. So this means that if we look at the open stratum, so the non-compactified one, what we need is to take all information that is coming from this graph is we simply delete the edge and we have a set of leaves 1 to n and the two half edges. which is isomorphic to mg minus 1, n plus 2. Here we want somehow to have as labels, let's say, 1, n, and then two identifications for the half edges, which, are, which we are identified, which in the general situation are not allowed to coincide with the nodes because of the way a stable curve is defined. 
Is that everything? Well, no, because of course, after we identify them, we can, there's no difference, we may switch H and H1, so we have to divide by an involution, this is my notation for the symmetric group, this is the involution, interchanging H and H prime. And the idea is that, of course, geometrically, we know that if you identify two points, uh, we don't know, we can't, uh, uh, we don't know anymore which one was the first one, which one was the second one. But morally, we can also say, well, we need to divide by an involution, because the involution interchange H and H prime, because this is the automorphism group of the graph. So if you look at the graph, an evolution has to respect everything, but okay, there is just one vertex, so this is going to be fixed. There are n leaves, but they are labeled, so we can't move them, because the labeling keep, keeps them mm, fixed. But then we have two half edges, and we can switch them, they are attributed to the same vertex, so that part of the structure is the only part of the structure we have to consider is satisfied, and they will, they, the involution interchanging them was part of the data, but if you interchange them, we get the same involution. So clearly, this was the automorphism group of the graph. So what this suggests is, well, if we want to construct the stratum, then we need to take, to isolate what happens at all vertices, look at the number of at the spatial points we have on them as a labeling, and then take uh, the product for all components and then divide by the automorphism group of the graph. And if you want to take the closure, well, if something lies here, this means that um, the only thing that can happen is that we have some further degeneration of the curve in which we have uh, additional nodes and uh, creating additional components, but still, uh, they will be all controlled if we take the blow up, we still get a stable curve of genus G minus one with N plus two marked points over there. So we don't know how to describe this. But this is controlled by taking the closure. by mg n plus 2, in the sense that we can use the identification of points to obtain what we call a gluing map. I will denote by m gamma zero, which starts from m bar g n plus two and ends in the closure of the stratum and is factors through the quotient by the automorphism group of the graph. check if I have the same mistake on the other blackboard. Yes, I see that also this was. You see, I, of course, I mean, it's, it's as I pictured it, so 
if we forget the leaves, this is the graph, and this is, we need to have g minus 1 to get a, a graph of genus G, because the genus of the underlying topological graph is 1, because we have this loop, and then we need to add g minus 1. We can do something similar for the case of a separating node, and then here we will need to glue together two curves, and which one has some kind of additional mark point on it, corresponding to the two half edges that we have. So we get if we if we denote the graph we have by M gamma, then the two ingredients we need is to have a stable curve of genus I. So let's say that we have let's take a simplified situation in which we have the leaves from 1 to M on one component and the leaves from M plus 1 to N on the other one. So we have N I M plus 1 times N bar G minus I N minus M plus 1 and this is going to our stratum. close one, and if we restrict this to the open part here and there, we get the open part. second map is an isomorphism once we quotient by the automorphism group of the graph, which, I mean, depends. So to be the automorphism group in this case can be non-trivial only if we have no marked points, because otherwise the marked points can be used to identify the components. So I would say the, autom the automorphism group is non-trivial only when i and g minus 1 are, e I are equal and there are no marked points. So this was the explicit construction we had in the case of codimension one, but actually the kind of recipe we used can be, can be applied more in general, because as I was saying, the data encoded in the dual graph is exactly the behavior of the normalization of each component of the curve. So the idea is that we pick a stable curve of the, of the right topological type to be a degeneration of a normalization of one of the components in the smooth case, and then the identification of the half edges is giving us a recipe to glue together a stable curve of the topological type we need. <coughs> so these are the most important kinds of gluing maps, but of course, any stable graph will give us a gluing map. So 
So what does it start? As I said, we need to pick for each irreducible component. Well, if we are taking just a normalization of a typical element, we need to take an something which is smooth of the genus given by the labeling of the graph with the number of special mark points that correspond to the number of special points we have. But because of the fact that we want to allow gen the generations, actually we need to take the closure here if we want to dominate the whole stuff. And in this way, we get a subjective map. And I said, this map factors to the action of the automorphism group. Which will interchange branches of nodes of the curves and possibly components. And if we prefer to, open, to work with the strata, so the locally closed ones, the ones which are disjoint, because the topological type is unique, And if you restrict to the case in which we are just speaking on singular components, <coughs> then we get again a subjective map this time to the, to the stratum, but now it's exactly the same as quotienting by the automorphism. So I'm calling uh, the M gamma strata, and there is a, this, the, this is natural when we are uh, sort of subdividing into these joint locally uh, closed subsets, but the concept of stratum also sort of implies that when we take the closure of the stratum, we should be able to describe this uh, as uh, the union of other strata. So the boundary of the stratum, the, the complement of n gamma inside n gamma bar should be a union of strata. So we may wonder in which cases we get for which other graphs we get something which lies in the closure of n gamma. Or equivalently, we may wonder in which cases n gamma prime bar is contained in n gamma prime. Let us assume that we have two graphs, gamma and gamma prime, and the closed stratum associated to gamma is contained in the closed stratum, uh, in the closure of the stratum associated to gamma prime. So one may wonder what this means. So uh, unless they are equal, this means that the number of, of singular points may only have increased because the way in which uh, we characterize them as components of the locus with a certain number of singular points. But exactly how can we recognize which uh, uh, strata with a higher number of nodes may be contained in this one. Well, the idea is that if one looks at the combinatorial data, this means that the graph gamma is more complicated than gamma prime. We can um, produce it out of gamma prime by substituting to a vertex a stable graph of the same, same type. And this is 
is expressed by saying that gamma is a specialization of gamma time. That is, we obtain gamma from gamma prime by substituting one of the some of the vertices of gamma prime with some dual uh, with some stable graph with the same invariance Does this work? Well, let's think that we start with a chosen graph gamma prime. I think it's taking three vertices, no math points, three true and true are the general, and here we have two loops. This is a possibility, so this means we need to pick some of the vertices and make them degenerate somehow. So the idea is that here, this vertex is giving us something of genus 3 with two spatial points. So we may insert for this any other thing of genus 3 with two, with two mark points. So for instance, we may substitute it. Let me think. If I take two things of genus, two gen uh, points of genus one, then one plus one is equal to two, and then I join them by two edges so that the genus of the underlying graph is one. This is something of genus three. Then I need to put two map points somewhere, for instance, both of them on this component, and I substitute this for that. So for the rest, I take exactly the same things and I join them using the same recipe, this is some kind of degeneration. Of course, I did it from, for one vertex. I could have done for more vertices, for all vertices, for no vertices, then of course, gamma and gamma time are equal, so this would be trivial. So this is how it, it works. But we can also, so this is a way to obtain the graph of, the, of a, or, um, so to obtain gamma from gamma prime, if we want to go in the other direction, what we do is that we need to contract some edges. So if we want to go from here to there, what we have to do morally is that we take the two additional edges here. If we contract them, we need to substitute for this. So if we choose which edges to contact, then we need to identify which vertices were involved. So those are going to collapse all together. So one plus one makes two. And then because of the fact that what we made collapse had, uh, was given an extra plus one because of its uh, fundamental uh, of the existence of the loop, we get something of genus three. So the idea is that in the other direction, we can interpret this as a contraction of two edges. And of course, if we contact something else, we get some other kind of, of, of specialization.
So as an application, let's just uh, classify all possible stable graphs of a given type and let us uh, determine the specialization. So I want to do this. In the case of genus 2 and no marked points. So the idea is that there are things we always have. Something we always have is the general stratum, of course. And then the dimension of M2, well, this is 3 times 2 minus 3, so this is equal to 3. So this means that we have room for up to three nodes. As I said, it's easy to know what the co-dimension one strata are because there are just two possibilities, a non-separating node, and then the genus of the component goes, goes down by one, and then we have a loop, and then we may have a separating node, but because of the fact that we have no, no marked points, if we take a separating node, it can never happen that we have something of genus zero and genus two because we have no marked points to stabilize this. So this cannot, this can't happen for stability reasons. So the only possibility to have one plus one Now it's more complicated to think what happens if we have two nodes. So this means that we need to create more graphs by um, specializing some of the vertices. So what can we do here? For instance, we can say, well, we can specialize these graph of genus one, this component of genus one with two marked points with something which is of genus zero, so rational, but with a loop. And then we kept this, so this is a possible co-dimension one stratum. But then something else we can do is for instance to pop up a new rational component because This is a possible, up to here, we get a possible curve, a stable curve of genus one with two math points, a stable one. And so now we identify this. So in here is a rather difficult to guess what is going on. So morally, I mean, if one wants to do it right, technically one should think of all possible degenerations of curves of lower genus, hoping we already have uh, classified them. And actually, as far as I know, this is the only, these are the only two possibilities. And now, as I said, so they correspond to curves with nodes, uh, with, a, mm, with two nodes, and then it's clear that this is a specialization of this one because if we contract this loop, we get this one. If we contract this edge, we get that one. So this is specialization of both. Here, because of the symmetry, if we want to know which graph this is a specialization, well, it doesn't matter. If we contact one loop, we get something of genus one with a single loop, so this is only a degeneration of that. So if we think, think about the geometry of strata, this means that this stratum is some kind of self-intersection of that one. And then there are only only two possibilities if we want to have stable graphs with three edges. So in the maximal stratum then, of course, all components will have genus zero because otherwise it would be able to degenerate things further. And if you look at all components, they will be trivalent graphs. This has to do with the fact that in this case, we are looking at the strata of dimension zero, and the only M, G, N, which has dimension zero, is M, zero, three. So here, if we contract something, we always get that one. So this is just a degeneration of this one, and this is a degeneration. So it looks like in this case, 
We have eight possible stable graphs. So let us look at what the strata are. I think this is the, the, these are the only two possibilities we can get in this case. You know, there are two ways, uh, there are two strata which are easier than the other ones. The, the codimension one stratum is easy in some sense, but in some sense also the stratum corresponding to points is easy because one, si one knows how many components one needs to have and one needs that everything will be trivalent. So the idea is that uh, one can check that these are the only ones just by taking the two components with three mark points and thinking about all possible ways of joining them by three edges giving something connected. And if you think about this by symmetry, there are just two possibilities. But of course, I mean, it's a, it's a huge combinatorial problem if you want to do it in general. Combinatorics of graphs is always, uh, yeah. So what are the other strata? Some of them we know already. So this is, has a, always an automorphous group, so this has the usual description, n1, 2 in this case, divided by the involution, interchanging these two points. And this is one of the cases in which also the other uh, divisor comes with an involution, because in this case, of course, you can interchange the two components. So this is something like the symmetric product of two copies of m1, 1. But then it becomes more complicated because, so this means that we have taken a rational curve with two, four points and we identify them pairwise. So in this case, actually, I think the automorphous group has order eight and it's something like an extension of S2 times S2 by S2. Yeah. So the first one is still the symmetric group, right? Yeah. I'm trying to write always the same, but I didn't. So why are there so many automorphisms? The idea is that we can interchange these two half edges. So we can interchange any pair of half edges we have identified. So this is going in involution, but also this one is giving an involution. But then, of course, if we wish, we can interchange both half edges at the same time, so we can interchange also the two loops. So this is giving, this is what I was saying. Clearly the automorphous group in which we are just fixing each one of the loops is giving this part of the automorphism is S2 times S2, and then we have an extension by another S2. I think the extension is actually trivial, but I haven't checked. Anyway, it's a group with eight elements. Let me write it formally, but I don't think it, this is actually, so, and then we can go on and do this kind of thing. So, this is better because here we see there is just a single automorphism in the graph. So, this is actually M11 times N03, in which we are able to switch two points. But M03 was a point, so even if we quotient it, it's not giving so much extra structure. And then we have just two complicated guys. But uh, yeah, we can describe them in terms of, of N03, but anyway, the strata in this case are closed, and they are points. And the idea is that one can do this in general, but it's not the kind of combinatorics you want to have to do explicitly, because it takes uh, a lot of, um, computation to get all possible stable graphs. So in theory, this works well, but uh, it's only useful if you are focusing on a specific problem in which the combinatorics is treatable. If you want to get general formulas, you can use this construction in a theoretical way, but you don't want to use this directly um, 
in any explicit way. But anyway, the fact that we have a, stat a stratification is something that will work well if we are working with some kind of additive invariant. Something like the Euler characteristic, let's say with compact support of a stratum, where this will, then the, the one for the whole modular space will be the sum of the one for the, all, for the open parts, and the open parts have some kind of inductive structure in terms of something which is of smallest genus. So. What I was saying is the closed guy is more complicated, but if we have some kind of additive invariant, we can try to get it from the ones of the strata. And the strata can be somehow controlled by taking the open modular spaces, which are, yeah. Uh, the, or like, is that the space this one? Yeah. Yeah, well, yes, you're right. I'm forgetting the automorphism when I. So, <laughs> yes. So, uh, points with automorphism. So, of course, if I just want to know the, the, the cohomology, the, the, the automorphism will not matter, but for some kind of construction, so I may, may be interested in prescribing something about the kind of representation we have and then. Uh, if we interchange edges, for instance. So it's not a, the automatic may well pay, pay a role. And what I was saying, yeah, but then we need, a, so for sure we only need the open parts. So the genus will be at most G, but how many mark points will we need at the end on a single component? So you want to feed us a little bit and things. Uh, Euristically, then one says, okay, the idea is that every time we lower the genus by one, we may have to pay for it by adding two. So every time we lower the genus by one, this means that we created an edge, so we created two special points, and we have, we have bad luck and they all end on the same component, we increase the total number of mark points on a component by two. So anyway, the number of mark points is increasing, but not in a, in a way we can control. So these are the, the things we may potentially have to glue together. Of course, this is an overkill because something like a, yeah, well, a single component of genus zero with so yeah, it may happen, yeah. So I guess that's uh, most cases we will see. So now, the idea is that we have three families of natural classes. So, Mumford's intuition was, well, these are the three kinds of, of classes we really need to do geometry, most natural Geometrical loci inside MG and bar will have a fundamental class, which is just some kind of linear combination of monomials, of, so of products of these classes. So where do they 
live all together. So somehow if we are working on the open MGN, we can say, okay, we may want to take the subthing of the cohomology just generated by the psi classes, the kappa classes, and the lambda classes. But then if we start to think about stable curves, we need a way to encode also the uh, stable, the, the strata classes into this. So it's not so clear what a natural definition would be for the ring that contains everything we want to contain. So. So all tautological classes we considered before. can be viewed as elements of a nice sub-ring, either of the Chow ring or the cohomology ring. And this is what is called the tautological. There is nothing tautological about the ring itself. It's more something like the fact that the, co the classes are coming from tautological bundles over the modular space. And if I look at the literature for some time, people were not quite sure of what the best way was to define the tautological rings, but at some point, Faber and Panda Panda gave the definition which is now used. And the idea is that because of the inductive way of constructing a, a straight a boundary strata by gluing maps, the easiest way to define the tautological ring, which is actually an algebra, is to do it for all values of G and N at the sign. So if we're working in cohomology, we know it is by N by G N. And this is the smallest subsystem, so collection of Q subalgebras of the even cohomology. said we want to take the, the grading that comes from co-dimension, so we'll get twice the same degree we had before. Which is closed and the push forward under the nature <coughs> maps, which are the gluing maps and the uh, forgetful maps. are just those that realize in all possible way n g n plus one bar as a universal curve over m g n bar. Mm, please notice that there are n plus one possibilities. So even if we fix g n n, we are free to forget any point here, otherwise we would get a theory which is not uh, really symmetric. And then the gluing maps, but then because of the fact that we can always factorize gluing maps through other gluing maps, it's enough to do them for divisors.
this is the one that is connected, that, that, that comes from a single separating node. We glue together to work out so G minus I and G minus I by putting, so the sum of all marked points is equal to N plus two because we have two additional edges. And they saw additional half edges, which we identified in the same way. You want to create a non separating node, we start with curves of genus G minus 1 with n plus 2 points. So the first case, I'm gluing something of genus i and something of genus G minus i with additional mark points. The separating node, and the other one is creating. Or something with G minus, or genus G minus 2 with two additional points, a curve in which the additional, sorry, of genus G minus 1 with two additional points, a curve in which the two points are identified. So this is a very compact definition. It's rather intuitive that in this way we will get the strata classes because we put the uh, gluing maps into the ingredients. It's less clear that we are obtaining. Uh, the psi and the, and the kappa classes. So for sure we get the kappa classes if we have the psi classes because they are created uh, by taking a push forward under a forgetful map. But do we really get the psi classes in this way? So the idea is that we will see later the lambda classes are actually can be obtained from the kappa classes. So the lambda classes are actually polynomials in the kappa classes. So if we can obtain the kappa classes, we obtain that. And of course, we obtain the kappa classes if we have the psi classes because we are taking the push forward. So the question is, are the psi classes there? So what is the trick? The idea is that the psi classes arise naturally when we have the self-intersection, when we are considering self-intersection of strata classes. So let us start with the curve of Gidus G. with n plus one mark points. Because of the fact, so we want n to be positive. So this means that we can, that if we join a g and we leave all other mark points on g with the rational components, so this black dot is just a component of genus zero on which we have a special points, the last mark points in the point i, and we take it square, then the self-intersection, so if we intersect this starting with itself, well, there, is no, there are no other ways to, to produce uh, so if we want uh, to intersect strata, we need to look at common degenerations. But if we think about this, this is the only degeneration uh, this uh, graph has in common with itself. So somehow, this means that it's uh, one of the, ca the cases in which we are taking the, uh, an intersection we supported on the, on the stratum itself. And actually, this. Uh, Thank you. 
morally should say that we have to, when we take the square of this, morally should say that we have to take a psi class here, a minus a psi class here, somehow. So we have to, to start with the class on mg n minus, uh, sorry, with mg n minus one here, which has a, a psi class here, and we need to decorate here with another psi class, but this is so small, so it's p with zero. So the punchline of this is using formulas for self-intersections, this is actually related with the psi class, which has something to do with the, this fixed mark point, uh, special point of the component of genus G. So if we take the push forward to, to MGN by the forgetful map of this, so this is the same pi we have here, this actually gives us minus psi i. So there is a geometric way to obtain psi i as the push forward under the forgetful map of an intersection of strata classes. Now, the strata classes were there, so the intersection have to be that we have a system of subalgebras, and then we push forward and we get something which is that. Yeah? How do you think of the psi classes as small loops near vertices? Oh, they are not small, small loops near vertices. Yeah, it's just, just, let me try to, um, to uh, make this picture a little bit bigger. So the idea is that if we take uh, the closed stratum corresponding, let, let me call gamma this graph just to be brief, this is dominated by taking M, G, so N, because we still have N once, because we moved out to one of the mark points and n plus one, so perhaps we have n. But we have a special point, and then it's times m zero three bar, which is not doing anything. So if we take this gluing map and gamma, then inside here we have the class which is taking the height psi class. So with the one which is, these are the other points, and then I is the one which gets identified with. The additional half edge here. So I could call it H, it's just that I was saying, uh, if we have N things, we can call it a psi I. So, convenient. so if you want, yeah. So let me call this H prime, so this is the psi class of H prime, and then I can just take the, well, this is just a point, so we can forget this. And then what I was saying is the excess bundle formula for the self-intersection is giving minus psi, minus the image of this class as, as, a, as a contribution. So, what I was saying is, if we take the stratum of sauté to gamma, I will not copy it again, and we take its square by the self-intersection formula, this will be uh, equal to the image, the push formula. I hope I did it right. Never mind, but anyway, so geometrically this means that when we push it down, we, we have to get this one again. And yeah, symmetrically we should also get a contribution of this component, but because of the fact that this component corresponds to a, one, a zero dimensional space, if we take any class there, yeah, well, so it's not giving anything. Sorry? I, I will explain it later. I'm becoming skeptical of the fact that I will do it today, but uh, I mean, it, it has uh, something to do with the general topic of finding relations between, uh, between tautological classes. So what I wanted to say is by an excess bundle computation.
So people didn't realize this directly. If you look at uh, all the papers, they were uh, asking explicitly to have a system of subalgebras that contains the psi, the psi classes, but actually, if you have the fundamental classes of strata, this is enough. So of course, uh, this is enough because we are working on the on the compact space. And then I gave this definition for MG and bar, but we are actually also very interested in an open subset of MG and bar, for instance, on MGN itself. So for open subset, we simply take the restriction of the tautological ring. So, which are, which are, what are the open subsets we are interested in? Well, of course, when we work to work on MGN, but there are actually also two other kind of open subsets, which are useful for the theory, the, those are curves of compact types. And curves with rational tails. So what are curves of compact type? Curves of compact type are curves whose only nodes are separating nodes. So the graph has to be a tree. So if all curves, are, if all uh, nodes are separating nodes, the idea is that we have taken away the closed divisor of curves with separating nodes. There is a zero. It's a closure of the stuff associated with the closed. I mean, I want this to be an open subset, so what do we exactly have to... Yeah, of course I need to remove all further the generations, but if there is at least one non-separating node, then the curve, then the graph must uh, be a specialization of this one, so the curve must lie in there. So if they have nodes, so they may be smooth curves, the curves are separating nodes. So the underlying graph is a tree, but it also means that the Jacobian of the curve is compact in the sense that uh, if we define the Jacobian of the curve, if, if we look at the at line bounds of degree zero on the curve, then we, what we find is the product of the Jacobians of the components. No loops on the dual graph because the loops in the dual graphs is what are contributing in non separating nodes and uh, of the curve is compact and it's in fact the product of the Jacobians of the component.
and curves with rational tails are curves that are that, are con that contain a smooth component of genus G. So this is the pre-image pi inverse of mg. Under the forgetful mapping, which we forget all mapping points. So the idea is that we start with mgn by, by composing forgetful maps, we can get to mg bar. And if the curve has a smooth component of genus G, then the image that lies here is uh, lies in the open in the open stratum mg. So we can take the pre-image of that. Of, the, of a curve with rational tails is, of course, if we have we have a smooth component of genus G. I mean, this this may well be empty if G is too small because this is only defined. Uh, so this kind of definition would only work, of course, if G is at most two is at least two. So we may have n distinct points here, but the curve is also allowed to sprout rational uh, trees of rational components on which the mark points lie. So Somehow this is favorable because it has some kind of vibration structure of Mg. Because this is some kind of special kind of configuration of points on a curve of genus G. And of course, if they have rational types, then the, the graph is clearly a tree. So it's a, an example of curves of compact type. And everything which is just given by a tree of curves. We give a curve of compact type. The restriction here is that all components but one have to be degree zero. So why are they interesting? Well, mainly the point is that tautological ring was introduced because working directly with the whole of the cohomology for some reasons, but also working directly with the whole of the Chow groups for some other reason, turned out to be incredibly complicated. So the idea is that we want to have some nice subring where we expect to find all information we need. And for uh, applications like to Gromov-Witten theory, certainly tautological classes, more or less by definition, are enough. And also there are several classes of geometrical uh, subvarieties whose fundamental class lies there. So this is nature. But still, if we want to find something, for instance, a relation between tautological classes, how are we going to do this? So the idea is that, well, this is very complicated combinatorially. So first we check it on MGN. Then we try to say, well, we, how does it extend to the part of the boundary of M bar GN in which we have curves with rational taste? Then we check it there. One may want to work here directly. In many cases, these two spaces are actually equal because of the fact that everything is controlled very well by MG. And then one tries to approximate the most powerful kind of result by allowing more and more types of degenerations. And I define everything uh, uh, by taking homology classes because I like homology classes. But actually, everything we gave can be also defined the same way as a system of subalgebras in the Chow ring. So if one takes the same definition, but as subalgebras, System of charlings of MGN bar. Uh, 
model time. So different the definition, which is perhaps more powerful, the definition of the tautological sublings, which in this case are denoted by R, not by IRH of MG. So one would expect that if one works in char rather than working in cohomology, that there is more information there because there is a cycle map that forgets a, a lot of the structure. But actually, in all known cases, these are isomorphic to the image in cohomology. So it's an open problem to know whether there is any valuable, any additional information here which is not present in the image in cohomology. By definition, if we a tautological class, we stay tautological. Is this always an isomorphism? There is no reason why it should, but there is also no counterexample. Finally, let me. Recall I write this as a theorem, it's more like a proposition, but it has two parts. Some of the structure of tautological things. So as I said, the definition with the with the system of subalgebras is very elegant, very compact, but from that it's perhaps not very clear how to general, uh, generate the tautological ring as a Q vector space. So what a, a system of linear generators would be. And the idea is that the tautological ring is generated by what are called decorated strata classes. So the images or products of tautological classes under arbitrary gluing maps. I to give a simple example. So the idea is that we take a stable graph. And then we put monomials. So if this is the point, mark points one, this is going to be psi one. We take monomials in the, we decorate it by putting a kappa and psi classes, if you want lambda classes. So uh, the, psi, the kappa classes decorate vertices, and the psi classes decorate either half edges or leaves. So what is this kind of thing? Well, this uses the fact that if we have the graph gamma given by one with the leave one and then two, then there is a map M gamma from M bar one, two times M bar two, one this component and that component to m gamma bar, 
which is contained in MGM. And then here we can take arbitrary tautological classes obtained by product of psi, kappa, and lambda classes. So in this case, we have psi 1 in this case, and then here we decorated the only edge by psi, so in some sense it is also psi 1, but we also took kappa 1, and we take this image. So this class, let me call it gamma, push forward of the tensor product of these classes. So the idea is that arbitrary gluing maps are going as ways to put arbitrary tautological classes on each product and to then turn them into something that lives on M bar G. And these are the linear generators. And as you suggested that I leave the second part of this for tomorrow morning. Let's do it like that. Sorry for going over time.